morning exercises, January 31st. And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Exodus 15.25 It is useless to inquire what kind of tree this was and whether the effect was produced by a quality inherent in the wood or by a miraculous application. The latter is far the most likely, but it has been disputed whether this transaction was designed to be an evangelical type. Perhaps it is impossible to determine this, and it is unnecessary. We shall only derive from it an illustration of a very interesting subject in which we are fully justified by the words of the Apostle to the suffering Hebrews. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. We, like these Jews, are traveling through a wilderness. In our journey we meet with bitter waters. These are the troubles of life, personal and relative. These are very distasteful and offensive to flesh and blood but they may be rendered drinkable. In other words, we may be able to endure the afflictions of life, yea, we may even acquiesce in them, and not only so, but glory in tribulation also. But how can this be done? Here is the secret. The cross on which the Savior died and conquered for his saints this is the tree, by faith applied, that sweetens all complaints. Thousands have proved the blessed effect, no longer mourn their lot. While on his sorrows they reflect, their own are all forgot. While they by faith behold the cross, though many griefs they meet, they draw again from every loss and find the bitter sweet. Let us see how the Savior's sufferings will alleviate ours. It is some relief in distress that others are exercised in the same way. Individuality of woe looks ominous. It is appalling to be singled out like a victim deer from the whole herd and suffer alone. Thus the Apostle tells the Corinthians that no temptation had taken them, but such as is common to man. And Peter also tells the sufferers he addressed that the same afflictions were accomplished in their brethren that were in the world. So it is, whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth. This has been the case with even his most eminent servants, and even his dear son, in whom his soul delighted, he, even he, did not escape. And shall we dread the fellowship of his sufferings? But if there is something to affect the mind, even in the reality of his passion, there is much more in the greatness of it. In general, our groaning is heavier than our complaint, and we are prone from our selfishness and ignorance to imagine our trials preeminent. He could say, Behold and see if ever there were sorrows like unto my sorrow. In our sorrow we have alleviations. Ours are not perpetual, but his continued through life. Ours are not universal, but he suffered in every part that was capable of suffering. He was a man of sorrows. Ours are not foreknown, but his were all laid out in prospect, and he suffered in apprehension as well as reality. No tongue can express or understanding conceive 
what he bore when his soul was exceeding sorrowful even unto death, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. We must also think of the dignity of this sufferer. We commonly and properly feel more for those who are reduced in life than for those who have never enjoyed a better state, because the penury is embittered by previous affluence. Job considers his former greatness as an enhancement of his fall and contrasts with the honor shown him in his prosperity the insults now offered him by those whose fathers he would have set with the dogs of his flock. They were children of fools, yea, children of base men. They were viler than the earth, and now I am their song. Yea, I am their byword. They abhor me, they flee far from me, and spare not to spit in my face. Jesus was the Lord of all, and all the angels of God worshipped him. Yet was he despised and rejected of men. He was buffeted, scourged, spit upon, and not only the scribes and elders, but the soldiers, the common rabble, and the very thieves set him at naught and vilified him. But who and what are we? Our foundation is in the dust. Man is a worm. It is condescension in God to have anything to do with him, yea, even to chastise him. What is man that thou shouldest magnify him, that thou shouldest set thy heart upon him, and that thou shouldest visit him every morning and try him every moment? But the great may render themselves worthy of their humiliations, and often have been righteously punished. We suffer justly because we suffer the due reward of our deeds. Good men themselves cannot complain or even wonder at their afflictions when they consider their years of irreligion and their sins since they have known God or rather have been known of him, for who can understand his errors? In the sudden and awful death of his two sons, Aaron held his peace. He had just before been aiding to make the golden calf. David had been recently guilty of adultery and murder, when therefore Absalom, his own son, as well as subject, rose against him, what could he but say of his offended God? Here I am, let him do to me what seemeth good unto him. I will bear the indignation of the Lord, because, says the church, I have sinned against him. But this man did nothing amiss. He was harmless, holy, separate from sinners. He could make the appeal to all his adversaries, which of you conceiveth me of sin? Yet he suffered, suffered though innocent, and was led as a lamb to the slaughter. His sufferings, therefore, were for us, only and entirely for us. And what can be more relieving in our sorrows than to consider the benefits we derive from his? Such is the benefit of an atoning sacrifice by which we are delivered from all condemnation and have peace with God and access to him. What are trials when there is no wrath in them, when they are only the effects of a father's care? Then the bitterness of death is past. Such is the benefit of a sympathizing friend who from his own experience can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, for in that he himself hath suffered. Being tempted, he is able also to succor them that are tempted. Such is the benefit of an example which shows us how to act and how to feel in the hour of trial, 
for he also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Such is the benefit of divine influence, for by dying he obtained for us the dispensation of the Spirit, which is therefore called his Spirit, and without the supply of which we must fail and sink, but his grace is sufficient for us. How encouraging, too, is it to remember the issue of his sufferings, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Our sorrows will also have an end, and the same end. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified together.